on YouTube. I don't know which one of you wants to start, if it should be Commissioner Schatz or probably Commissioner Schatz with Woodside, because that, that's the first piece that then moves to the other. Does that make sense? Sure, that makes sense to me. <laughs> OK, that's great. Welcome. This is House Corrections and Institutions, and we are here this afternoon until approximately 3.30. Uh, we're going to be hearing at the beginning here an update about the uh, Woodside situation and moving the youth uh, to different placements. And finally, now they're at the Middlesex Secure Residential Facility. So the patients from the secure um, Middlesex Secure Residential Facility, which was which is a mental health uh, arena, have been moved to a unit in the state hospital in Berlin. So we've got some questions. We wanted an update. And I think first place we'll start is with Commissioner Schatz of DCF to talk about the move of the youth from Woodside to the other placements, what the thinking is. And um, also from this committee perspective as well, if Woodside's gonna be used for mental health patients with COVID-19, is there any infrastructure changes that might need to occur in the interim or not? So Commissioner Schatz, welcome. And if you could identify yourself for the record and we'll get started. Glad to do so. I'm Ken Schatz, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. We do appreciate the opportunity to fill you in on um, what has uh, been going on in the last few weeks. As you all know, all of us are uh, striving to address this pandemic. It's in, it is incredibly challenging. I think all members of our community obviously are impacted. Uh, it has, in fact, also uh, affected our state systems. And so really what this is about was in uh, discussions with the Department of Mental Health, uh, recognizing that they had a significant need to have an alternative site for psychiatric patients um, with COVID-19 symptoms. They had identified working with other hospitals and Sarah Squirrel can fill you in more detail that um, Woodside uh, might be a facility that would meet their needs. As we continue to only have um, three or four kids, it made perfect sense to us that we would vacate that facility for the greater good. And so we moved very quickly uh, to identify along uh, getting support from the agency human services as a whole, and frankly, community providers. We found a place in St. Albans um, that was available, that seemed like a good spot. We moved very quickly on March 24th uh, to set up a program at Suite 12. Uh, this was, uh, set up to be a, a staff secure program. Um, we uh, had uh, four kids there. We, the, um, it had flexibility to be used for a variety of youth. We had thought we would be able to put um, locks and alarms on the doors and windows to provide an appropriate level of security. And frankly, need, I need to own that we moved perhaps too quickly and didn't nail that down. And it turned out we could not do that to the facility. That is, we could not have that level of security. We did have a, a couple of escapes that made it abundantly clear that even though, again, we thought we had enough staff to appropriately supervise the youth, that the nature of the situation just wasn't working. Along that period of time, again, in consultation with the Department of Mental Health, we discovered that the department had made plans to temporarily move um, the patients in Middlesex to the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. And so uh, I think it was uh, Tuesday of last week, um, th that facility was vacated. And so again, uh, working quickly and our staff um, moved very quickly. Uh, to recognize that we viewed the site, we worked with uh, BGS and the Department of Mental Health to uh, basically transition into that facility so that that is in fact a facility with um, locked doors, with a perimeter fence. Candidly, although I haven't been there myself, I'm told that it has actually uh, um, nicer facilities than Woodside with respect to the care and um, treatment of youth. And so we quickly moved there as of Monday, April 6th. Um, we moved kids into that program. Uh, they, I believe today there's three kids there. 
Uh, the it, it's a five bed facility for us in terms of how we'll set it up. It is locked. And so we will only be having youth who are involved in the delinquency system or youth who are under the custody of the Commission of Corrections. Um, we will follow the same um, legal and uh, protocol procedural safeguards with respect to secure facility, um, following also the um, relatively new policies that have been implemented to address issues uh, raised in litigation and also with respect to uh, special needs of youth. And so all of that is in place. Uh, we do see this as a temporary program. We know that the Department of Health, Mental Health plans are to uh, move back uh, to that facility uh, uh, after the um, situation, if hopefully will calm down relatively soon in terms of the pandemic. So we are continuing to move forward with our plans as described in our in our proposed budget for 21 uh, to no longer use Woodside for youth as of July and to have alternative sites available for the care and supervision of youth uh, in residential programs as needed. We're continuing that effort, uh, by the way, in terms of talking to uh, various community providers uh, and continuing to look at uh, the alternatives available to us. So I'll sort of stop there and glad to answer questions. Okay, questions of the committee. Folks, anyone? Kurt and then Sarah. Uh, has there been, I realize that there's pressure, but um, has there been any long-term thoughts of where the youth from Woodside would end up after yes. all this is over? Yes, we, we, um, we did, as you may recall, do requests for proposals. We did receive responses to that. We did get one that is promising. We're discussing with them the possibility of creating a, um, a residential program that would be available to meet the needs of youth with behavioral issues, including mental health and, and maybe even autistic um, challenges. That's not a short-term solution. That would be something that, um, if it, if it, if we are, if our negotiations are successful, wouldn't come online for a while. So in the meantime, we are talking to a variety of um, designated agencies and co other community providers uh, with respect to what we still perceive as our need for three to five secure beds. Okay. Thanks, uh, Sarah. Kurt actually asked my question. So. so for those three, the three youth that are currently at the Middlesex facility, would they qualify for that uh, new proposal that was just submitted to you in the community? I mean, actually, because I don't know exactly what the negotiations would result in, the short answer is maybe. So we would still need possibly a placement for three to five youth that a community setting might not be able to take depending on negotiations with the community's system well we know we need to have a need for the three to five secure beds if this new program is able to meet that need of course that that is available but also to be straightforward about it my thinking is i'd like to have the secure beds dispersed around the state not just in one location so that we don't have the um extended transportation issues um, from one end of the state or the other if there's a need for placement. So from my perspective as a system, I think there's value to having some secure beds in different parts of the state, albeit a small number. So Commissioner, should those secure beds be physically secure or staff secure? I think we need some level of physical security. Um, there, again, because the numbers are so small, there's some advantages to having flexibility depending on the size of the program. That is, when there really is a need to have locked doors, we want to have locked doors. But frankly, if we don't have to, I'd like a program to enable the youth there to have uh, a little bit more access to the community as um, safe and appropriate for them. Okay. Any other questions? Butch? Oh, Butch and then Kirk. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, so, of the three youths that you have now in Middlesex, 
to date, did those youths come to you by, via uh, the courts uh, and DOC? One of them is a child in the custody of the Department of Corrections. The other two uh, came through DCF and the youth justice system. Okay, so just trying to figure out your census. Uh, in that, and I'm assuming the uh, the youth that came to you through through DOC is required to have a secure place to be. We're still working through some of those details with DOC because, in fact, DOC it's their responsibility to supervise a youth in their custody. They actually have some flexibility <laughs> on a case by case basis as to whether or not the youth is in a locked facility or not. But to be clear, when we look to the future, and, and, and when I talk about the three to five secure beds, I'm including the needs of those youth in the custody of the Department of Corrections. My view is we, even though legally they can be held in an adult facility, as long as there's sight and sound separation, that's not a good environment. Um, and so we are trying to meet that need um, within our youth system. Okay, thank you. Kurt? Uh, yeah, two questions. What's, what's the age, roughly, of the ones that we're, we have now in custody there? I don't, I don't have that right at the tip of my fingertips, but typically it's, it's primarily 15 to 17 year olds. Okay. And, and I assume that because all these are actually coming through the judiciary in one way or another, that we still have the same Medicare, Medicaid funding issues where they would not be, regardless of where they're held, they still would not qualify for Medicaid funding. Uh, in terms of our present program in Middlesex, that's absolutely correct. And if they were like a sweet 12 or something like that? That would still be, so that would still be the same challenges regarding receiving Medicaid funding. The thing that might be different to put it out there is if we are able to work with a um, community-based program, particularly if it's managed and operated by a community-based nonprofit, and it's open to youth other than just youth coming through the justice system, then we have the possibility of receiving Medicaid funding. Okay, thanks. Okay, anything else, Commissioner Schatz, before we move on to Commissioner Squirrel and Morning Fox? Okay, Commissioner Squirrel, welcome. I don't envy you either. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, we certainly appreciate the support and understanding of the legislature. Um, I'm sure Commissioner Schatz, Deputy Commissioner Fox would agree. It's been um, an intense time for us um, as we are trying to manage um, a pandemic um, and keep Vermonters safe. Um, also, I think just as a preamble, you know, to some of the thinking and strategic planning that we've done, uh, that we've done, that you know, when you're dealing with an infectious disease outbreak, you're always behind where you think you are. Um, so a lot of the decision-making that we've been doing is really trying to be thoughtful about not just tomorrow, but two weeks from now, where could we be as a system of care and how do we absolutely ensure that we have adequate capacity for vulnerable Vermonters across the state? Um, so to that end, on Friday, I think it was March, 20th, which seems like years ago, um, we convened all of the hospital leadership from across the state, all inpatient hospital directors, um, knowing that what we were looking at as a state system based on the trending models was that we could hit a point in time within our overall medical system where all of our beds would be full across the state from a med surge capacity. So of course, immediately we were worried about individuals who would or could be you know, presenting in an emergency department with significant psychiatric needs, meaning that they needed to be hospitalized for their psychiatric needs, possibly COVID positive, but their COVID positive symptoms might be mild. Um, so absent their psychiatric symptoms, you know, these would be individuals who would be told to you know, you know, go home, convalesce at home and take care of yourself. Obviously for someone who has significant psychiatric needs, um, that would require a hospital level of care, that was not an option for them. Um, 
So the outcome of those meetings, and we meet with our network of hospital partners on a weekly basis, um, was a recommendation um, that we move quickly uh, to immediately stand up an alternative inpatient facility um, that could serve those um, who needed hospital level of care for their psychiatric needs, um, were positive uh, for their COVID, um, but had mild COVID symptoms. Um, and when we looked across the system and where would we have capacity, um, Woodside emerged as a potential location. Um, and certainly that, that recommendation, I guess, achieved three goals from our perspective, which is why we made it, um, that we would have capacity to treat those who were COVID positive, um, who had mild symptoms, but significant psychiatric needs, that we would mitigate the spread of COVID in our inpatient facilities. Um, we did worry a lot about if we had an outbreak in one of our inpatient psychiatric facilities, what that could do to our system um, very quickly. Uh, which would certainly limit access to those who may need it. Um, and we wanted to try to preserve the resources and capacity within our medical system as well. Um, certainly no one wants to be making these kinds of decisions. And as the Commissioner of Mental Health, I would never be coming to you making a recommendation that any psychiatric treatment should occur at Woodside. However, when we're staring down a pandemic and trying to make decisions to ensure that we have some capacity for individuals it made sense. And from a parity perspective, across our healthcare system, you know, we're preparing for surge with field hospitals being erected, alternative sites being located, um, et cetera. Um, so that was some of the thinking. Um, we also know that this is an evolving situation and we will continue to make changes um, as we see necessary. I would also note that, you know, the Woodside space if you will, is being loaned to DMH for contingency emergency use, um, that the future of Woodside will remain a discussion and decision for the legislature. So I just think that's also important to note that this really is a short-term emergency um, effort on our behalf. Um, in terms of what we've actually done so far, you might have questions about just the facility itself, um, what we had to do um, or have done so far to make it safe. I mean, certainly when we look at, you know, um, you know, ligature risk, et cetera, um, that is where the Woodside facility um, presents with um, more safety options and other options like a, a dorm, a college dorm, for example, which would have so many significant safety risks particularly for those who might be um, uh, suicidal or a danger to themselves. Um, that doesn't mean we didn't have our work cut out for us just in terms of, you know, trying to make the space as therapeutic as possible. You know, some um, investments in the facility itself um, to try to create that what's closer to hospital level of care. And then at the same time, you know, we feel a strong sense of responsibility to ensure that we would have the adequate medical personnel and medical equipment, knowing what we know about the progression of COVID, um, that knowing that um, our psychiatric patients um, have high comorbidity um, with other kind of respiratory um, uh, risks, um, and that they may not be able to fully articulate their symptoms um, as well as we might hope. Uh, so we really have been working to ensure that uh, the facility is appropriate, we have the right equipment, and we have the appropriate medical personnel. Um, I can tell you today um, that we have not adequately, adequately identified um, enough medical personnel um, to staff the facility in the way that we think we would need to. Um, so we are waiting. We are kind of in a little bit of a, a holding pattern right now while we're waiting to see um, if we can um, recruit um, and retain the adequate medical personnel um, to provide that level of care. We also to continue to have conversations with other inpatient um, partners about mm -hmm. other options. Um, should we not be able to, uh, I guess, acquire or retain the appropriate medical personnel that we think we need uh, for the facility? Uh, so that's just kind of a, a, a quick um, snapshot of what, we're, what we've done so far. Um, we have not made significant changes to the facility itself 
Um, I think there have been some equipment that's been ordered, um, some painting that's been done, some cleaning that's been done, um, but very minimal, I guess, um, from a, a real investment of dollars um, at this point. Um, so just so folks are aware of that. I would also just underscore that this is intended to be kind of a worst case scenario option for us. So if we are able to, and you know, I think we're going to see some new modeling over the next couple of days in terms of the trajectory of COVID in Vermont, if we can maintain adequate capacity within our broader medical system, obviously we want any individual, regardless of having psychiatric symptoms or not, to be served in a medical setting. Um, and that is our priority that if an individual who presents with psychiatric um, needs and is COVID positive, if there's capacity within our broader medical system, that is where they will be admitted. And that is the priority. Woodside is to, intended to be kind of a worst case scenario med surge option for us as a system of care. Um, we did um, ensure that as we were thinking about this idea, um, we communicated clearly um, with uh, the appropriate stakeholders, um, uh, Disability Rights Vermont, uh, Legal Aid, NAMI Vermont, uh, some of those groups um, worked in, in consultation with them to make sure that they were aware of what we were thinking and planning. Um, so I can pause there or I can just pivot right into kind of giving you a sense of the middle sex move um, and give you that information and then maybe take questions, whatever the chair prefers. Why don't we stop right there and let me just open it up for questions. Any questions from the committee? Carl? Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, I just had to unmute myself there. And my um, my uh, internet connection here has been a little bit unstable. So if for some reason I get cut off, just let me know. Um, can you just give us a sense of what, what sort of numbers you, you've designed the sort of surge facility there at Woodside for, and, and I, I, am I correct in understanding you don't have any patients there now? That's correct. We do not have any patients there now. Um, we still have adequate capacity in our inpatient psychiatric system and within our medical system. Um, the overall capacity of Woodside, I believe, is 30, 25 to 30. I think we were thinking a maximum of one to 10, um, just given um, the guidance that we have from the CDC and VDH about, about viral load, um, trying to maintain adequate um, distancing between patients, et cetera. Thank you. And the limitation of access to medical personnel also drives a lot of that capacity as well. Thanks. So we have a couple more questions, Sarah and then Butch. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so I have a couple of questions. You know, you know, I'm I, uh, I'm from Southern Vermont, so we've been hearing a little bit about what's going on in our local hospital and the Brattleboro retreat. Um, and so I'm curious to know how that's been going from your perspective. The Brattleboro retreat is preparing to have COVID beds because Woodside is not staffed and open yet. And I'm just curious if there's a role for them. If you're anticipating that they'll be playing a statewide role there yeah that's a, a good question and we did um speak yesterday um with folks from Brattleboro memorial hospital um, that's part of the collaboration that's happening i think what you're seeing is um and even when we were having initial conversations about a statewide approach to this um was there capacity that was needed in the southern part of the state um, and if things were unfolding quickly, knowing it was going to take us some time to get Woodside up and running. I think Brattleboro Memorial um, has also been concerned, you know, they're a very small hospital. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what did they feel that they would have the capacity um, uh, to really do, you know, if there was, you know, kind of a, an influx of COVID positive patients at the Brattleboro retreat? Um, so I think they have worked collaboratively together um, to come up with a solution for kind of that worst case scenario. I don't think any of our solutions across the state are perfect right now um, because essentially the retreat is trying to create a negative pressure environment, um, which is always challenging. Um, I'm sure they're thinking about the same things that we are having adequate medical personnel. Um, it does sound like Brattleboro Memorial and the retreat are working very collaboratively together around that. 
Um, and at the same time, we would also underscore and advocate that from a parity perspective, uh, we would hope that individuals who have um, uh, psychiatric challenges and COVID positive symptoms that would require hospitalization would of course be admitted in a hospital setting. Um, so I think that's kind of a quick summary of what I understand that they're, they're planning. And I thank you. Um, I've also heard anecdotally that the number of folks coming into the emergency room with mental acute uh, mental health issues is really much, much dramatically lower. Is that is that true statewide? Yes, across the system of care right now, we have seen a, a general slowdown, if you will, um, that we are seeing, um, you know, part of the strategy when you're a folk, um, I guess, staring down an infectious disease, disease outbreak and you're managing a medical facility, um, you try to decompress your units as appropriate because we don't want people, you know, in these close settings um, if that's not necessary. So I think there was our, our teams across the state, you know, discharged where appropriate, you know, so overall we're seeing lower census across our inpatient system. Um, and then I think because there is, you know, people are self-isolating, they're not out in the community as much. Um, that we have seen a general slowdown in individuals coming to the emergency departments. Um, for example, today we had no people waiting in the EDs, um, which certainly, you know, given what we're facing as a state, um, you know, one might say is a, is a good thing. Um, at the same time, that also worries me um, as the commissioner of mental health. Um, that we may have individuals who are experiencing significant psychiatric distress, are afraid, you know, not going out in public, afraid to go to the ED, um, and are maybe not getting access to the kind of care that they need. Um, so that's something that we're keeping an eye on. Um, certainly our community mental health agencies are working very hard to ensure that the folks that they are connected to, CRT clients, et cetera, we're doing a lot of targeted outreach. Um, but yes, generally we're seeing a slowdown I would also, um, my thinking is that we may at some point see more of a surge of need um, on the mental health side broadly across the state as maybe we move into more recovery mode um, as a state. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Butch. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, I'm sure you're going to mention this, but I don't want to miss it when you get into the next piece about moving folks around. We we're very interested in, in seeing how seeing how you opened up beds at VPH, uh, what, whether you had that capacity there or if, if you had to create capacity, and uh, and how the folks uh, took to the move, and what's the uh, the environment they're in, and, and is that current environment beneficial to them, to, to, to the folks that you had at Middlesex? And then was, lastly, I guess, uh, was the, uh, all this move that you made, which took, I'm sure, some monumental decisions, uh, was that in preparation for uh, freeing up Middlesex for uh, maybe the folks from uh, DCF, or was it just the best move to make at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all great questions. Um, so I'll uh, just share with the committee kind of how we got to that decision making around Middlesex, um, if that's okay. Yeah, that's um, a good transition. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we, like other um, medical providers across the state, um, immediately started um, experiencing significant staffing shortages um, in at VPCH. Um, so we have uh, some, there are some waivers that have been afforded to hospitals in terms of flexibility and staffing grids, et cetera. Uh, but we started seeing significant staffing shortages in our critical staff, such as nursing staff. Um, we share staffing with Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital and MTCR. Um, and it, we, we kind of hit a tipping point um, where we did not have adequate nursing coverage and care for Middlesex to be able to cover both locations. Um, we had also um, appropriately had um, consolidated um, folks at VPCH onto our A and B units. Um, again, that's overall slowing in the system. So we had some capacity at VPCH. Um, the so, T so, Commissioner, can I just interrupt? A and B 
Are they each eight bed units? Yes, that's correct. I think so. Deputy okay. Commissioner Morning Fox, are they each at eight bed units, A and B? Yes, they are. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, just so visual, because we've taken a tour of the facilities, so. Yes, yes. Yeah, they're the two larger units. Okay. Um, so we did, our team, our leadership team at VPCH, um, you know, did make the decision that um, you know, in order to ensure adequate staffing um, for the individuals at Middlesex, we needed to consolidate um, those groups together. We had um, C unit um, on at the hospital that was open. Um, so we did decide to move those residents so that we could maintain appropriate staffing. Um, those residents are occupying a separate unit um, from A and B. Um, they are not admitted to the hospital. Um, so Middlesex is a therapeutic community residence. It is licensed as a residential facility. So while they are currently residing at the hospital, they're not admitted to hospital level of care. Um, they're also still receiving their um, kind of daily residential programming, you know, access to the library, the activity rooms, the outdoor space. Um, and certainly now have more adequate access um, to staff and critical resources. Um, the move itself went well. Um, I can't say that it wasn't without its bumps. Um, certainly when you're moving folks who are used to their current residents um, who are there because of significant um, psychiatric needs, um, that was a transition for them. I think the staff at VPCH and MTCR, you know, did a commendable job of, you know, trying to make that um, as thoughtful and safe a process as possible. Um, from a safety perspective, there weren't any significant safety concerns at all. Um, it was more of just the transition of being in a new space. Um, and, you know, as I, you know, speak with the CEO of VPCH on a daily basis and the nursing team and social work team there, um, the residents do seem to be um, settling in. So to um, uh, Representative Shaw's question, we made that decision long before um, it was determined that the alternative uh, site, Suite 12 for DCF was not going to work. And then of course we said, well, now Middlesex is open. Um, so we DMH essentially offered that to DCF to say, you know, this might be an appropriate interim um, place for um, the youth uh, that were moved to suite 12 to reside. So, and this is a question, but, and this may be too early to tell, but for both Commissioner Squirrel and Commissioner Schatz, do you think once everyone settles in to this new environment where we know the state hospital, it's a much, when we toured it, we said, boy, this is where the secure residential really needs to be. It's a much more therapeutic facility that, that they, that population could avail themselves of. And with the Middlesex secure residential, which we've been trying to replace, that environment is very different for those use than Woodside. So the folks have been there now for a few days, not quite a week. Are either one of you seeing any tempering down of behavior issues or mental health issues or, or anything based on their environment that's a softer environment, respectively? I can't speak to anything that I specifically related to the folks at MTCR. Um, or whoever, who are now up at BC, BPCH. Um, I don't know, Ken, if I can't comment on the youth who are now in the Middlesex facility. Yeah, one thing that I will say is I don't have anything definitive, but I have to say that even when we made the move to Suite 12, one of the things that was good was having more access to the community, which mm -hmm. is generally speaking a good thing, so long as we can appropriately supervise those youth and uh, they adjust appropriately. So that, from my perspective, was a bit of a positive. The move to um, Middlesex, and by the way, we're calling it the Middlesex Adolescent Program now, um, is, is too recent to uh, really uh, make any determinations. Okay, it'll be interesting to see as the days go one, forward. 
Yeah, one thing I also want to make sure we're all clear about is that the reason we're able to um, make this move to utilize VPCH, which under normal circumstances is hospital level of care, is because of the flexibility that we have under our current 1135 waiver, which is because of um, the pandemic. So that's not something we would be able to continue to do um, beyond this current crisis. So I just wanna make sure that we're, we're clear on that. CMS has created flexibility for us um, because they agreed with our decision-making from a safety standpoint. Um, it's not something that we could continue to do beyond the crisis. Okay, good, that's good to know, thank you. We yeah. have a question, Kurt? Um, I'm not sure whether you may have just answered it, but um, and also when you talked about um, a potential surge in the emergency rooms as we begin to move out of this, um, the, out of COVID-19. And I, I have concerns about that too, because I know, um, or I believe that, you know, a lot of elective surgeries and things are being held, are being put mm -hmm. on hold, that the hospitals are not all that busy now, but when we start leaving, they're going to get, it seems to me, very busy. And you know, last year, several years ago, our big concern was the backup in emergency rooms. And that's why we were talking about expanding um, the VPCH and, thing, and finding alternatives for those people. What's gonna happen when this begins to hit again? Is there a plan yet for covering um, these people when that happens? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we look at now, um, as I mentioned earlier, is across our inpatient system of care, we're probably running on average between you know, 50 and 60%, um, taking off the level one. Our level one beds remain um, very, very high occupancy. So we have some capacity in the system now. There, there's just not, a, we aren't seeing the folks in the emergency department. So as we, ideally, hopefully move towards a path of recovery as a state, as we start to see more individuals who do have acute psychiatric needs that will require a hospital level of care, we have the capacity in the system. I think the bigger question will be, do we have all the staff back um, that we need to maintain that capacity? Um, because one of the reasons that we're having to consolidate units, um, close down units, um, is because we, we simply don't have the staffing. Um, so as long as the staffing come back um, as we recover as a state, um, we should be able to rebound in terms of our capacity and our inpatient system. Okay, well, one more question or concern. Um, my understanding is that the middle sex is kind of a step down from B VPCH, and now we've kind of, we've kind of stepped them back up. Is there is there a dis a difference between the kind of um, environment or the programming that they're in at VPCH now that makes it qualitatively different from from being uh, in the way that the otherwise in VPCH? Do you see what I mean? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, and I'll probably defer to Deputy Commissioner Fox on this as well, but um, therapeutic, um, so when we think about acute inpatient hospitalization, you're kind of immediately assessing treating and trying to work towards a lower level of care. Um, these individuals um, have stepped down essentially from that acute hospital level of care and are now receiving more therapeutic treatment in terms of daily living skills, um, counseling, so that then they can make that next step to a lower level of care. Um, so the programming that they're continuing to receive as part of their kind of, um, which we call is it ADLs, um, daily living skills, um, is different maybe than the kind of programming that you might be receiving in inpatient care. Um, but I'll just defer to Deputy Commissioner Fox, who, who likely has more to add to that. The, the, uh, their programming uh, uh, will, will, will be the primary piece that's different um, than, than the other patients at uh, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. Uh, so the goal is that the, the type of programming and uh, and treatment orientation that they were receiving at Middlesex, they're going to continue to receive. The, the only main difference really should be just the physical location is different. Uh, both sites, uh, because of COVID uh, and the, the, the pandemic, uh, 
we have stopped doing uh, community visits um, and having visitors coming in to try to prevent uh, um, uh, infections because uh, the folks who live at, at uh, Middlesex and now the C unit at VPCH, they're some of our more uh, uh, medically compromised uh, folks, a number of uh, 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 very elderly COPD, you know, chronic health conditions uh, for folks there. So we, we had to be very conscious and cognizant of, of that. And so we had already stopped uh, that type of uh, community outings. Um, so that, that's not a change by coming up to the hospital. And it'll be the goal similar to moving back to OTCR as soon as we're on kind of that other side of the, the curve, if you will, that we're able to move back to Middlesex. And at that same time, it'll be also moving back into uh, community outings and, and those types of things. But as far as the internal treatment, uh, their programming will remain essentially the same, which is different than the type of programming uh, and such for the, the other patients in the hospital. They will not be uh, subject to any kind of emergency procedure. They would not be secluded or restrained, uh, you know, none of those types of things. Um, and that's, sim you know, based on what uh, Commissioner Squirrel was mentioning is that, you know, they're not admitted to the hospital. Um, that they're just, we, we just basically kind of are using the physical location as a place for them to be, to, to be living at uh, for the time being. So we have a couple more questions. Are you done, Kurt? Okay, uh, Sarah and then Butch. Um, so it's kind of a follow-up question. I'm curious, when we're talking, you're talking about staffing. I know at Woodside, there were roughly 50 staff members there. Where have they gone? Um, and maybe that's a question for Commissioner Schatz. Got it. So that was the total number. Frankly, that has been reduced over somewhat over time as um, the population has decreased and we've made our proposal subject to legislative approval to close Woodside. Some staff have moved on um, to other positions. Moreover, some staff are also impacted um, by COVID-19 in terms of uh, their, uh, their concern in terms of their own health. Uh, with Sometimes it's their child care situations that have resulted in a decrease. So uh, I think we have approximately, I'll say 25 active staff members now, which is the number that we need because of course we need to do um, several shifts to provide 24 seven coverage. Yeah, okay. And the other question, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if you've addressed this already. Have there been any confirmed cases um, among the staff or the, the patients at any of the facilities? Have you been? I'm knocking some plastic. Um, <laughs> the reality is, as I sit here right now, I'm not aware of any uh, confirmed cases of either uh, youth in DCF custody or DCF staff. That's great. And how about it? Um, the, the hospital, the state hospital? Yeah, we've had um, a few staff um, who are been tested, um, persons under investigation, I think is the current um, acronym. Um, I don't believe that we have had any positive tests um, for staff or patients at this time. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Keep it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, Butch. You got to unmute, Butch. Something happened. You got to unmute. So I, a drop down came just as I went to hit the mute button. So anyway, sorry about that. No, that's fine. Too many emails uh, coming in. Yeah. So for the deputy commissioner, uh, talk a little bit about uh, up at uh, VPH with the folks there from, from Middlesex. Uh, are there challenges or whatever for separation and security? and the folks there from Middlesex being able to, to, to get outside similar to what they had down at, down in Middlesex. And I'm thinking outside the box a little bit now, so. Sure, no, they, we have two separate yards at uh, VPCH. Uh, and so we ensure that uh, the folks on uh, C unit, the Middlesex uh, folks have uh, access to a separate yard um, uh, depending on what's what's available or what's free and the needs at the time, but that they always have the access to a separate yard uh, from uh, those that would be that would be occupied by the uh, the patients. Um, and we've got other kind of 
uh, different things that are in place to to uh, uh, make sure that folks are are understanding and know who the residents are versus who the quote unquote patients are uh, who are uh, in the hospital. Uh, separate dining, separate uh, yard, uh, all those kind of things. The the staff is, as Commissioner Squirrel mentioned, the staff we share the staff between the two facilities. However, there are certain staff that have a primary um, uh, placement. Uh, so there are some staff whose primary placement is the hospital, and others their primary placement is Middlesex, and that's going to remain the same. That those primary uh, uh, staff will remain the primary staff for uh, Middlesex. Um, okay. The extra supports would come from other staff that work in the hospital. Um, but if there was, say, an emergency or something of that sort on the Middlesex unit, they really put in place the protocol so that that emergency uh, response would be the same as if it were happening actually at the Middlesex facility, uh, where we'd be working with Washington County uh, screeners if there was a need for an EE, uh, things of that sort, uh, and only, and then to avoid the need of going, say, to an emergency room uh, for an emergency exam, we would have screeners come in, our doctors can do their portion, and we would just move someone from the middle sex unit to an inpatient unit. Uh, okay. That's also avoiding having to go to the emergency room and all of those complications with that. So I, I, th I think you're pretty sure I heard you say that the, that the separation's okay, working well, the security's yes. okay, they have outside activities, their yep. programming, similar to the programming they had at Middlesex. However, my question was, uh, my next question was at Middlesex, were they uh, allowed to prepare their own meals? And not really. The, the kitchens in Middlesex are not made for doing large meals. Uh, we have the capacity from fire marshal uh, uh, concerns. Uh, you remember the, the stoves don't have any kind of venting hoods. Um, so they'd be able to do some, some smaller, uh, you know, baking, you know, type things to, to work on that kind of skill base. Um, and that's a bit trickier, uh, to be honest, yeah. right now. Uh, so so just, just, as I, just as I asked the question, I suddenly realized that they're shipping meals down there from, from right. uh, DH uh, on a daily basis. So not having, not having a uh, uh, place to prepare food uh, does not affect their, their, their programming. It's it, it, it I'll be honest, that is a piece that is Im impacted. Um, that is that is probably the one area that we we're still working on trying to figure out if we can find some other alternative means. But, you know, we have a large industrial kitchen um, that, you know, would not there's no way we can make that safe, you know, to to, to try and do that. Uh, I believe we do have microwaves and things of that sort. So that they are still using those types of things. And that's generally what a lot of the residents at Middlesex would use uh, microwaves. So, Heat up tea, make oatmeal, things of that sort. Thank you. Yep. So, anything else? We're bumping up against the two other folks who are waiting to testify on S three thirty eight, and I don't want to take up the commissioners and deputy commissioner time anymore. And we absolutely have to. Is there any other questions? Okay. If not, thank you, both commissioners and deputy commissioner. I know you're doing yeoman's work. I wanna thank you on behalf of the committee for all that you're doing. Thank you for taking some time here to give us this update. It really does help us in our work going forward in one way or another. It is all not for naught. <laughs> you're very welcome, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you for your support. No problem. Take keep, care everyone. Keep your chin up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay, folks, time to transition.